In this edition, we've got some fantastic layouts to share with you, including some that have been in operation for decades. As for prototypes, we'll take you to some absolutely amazing railroad destinations and explore great equipment from the past and present. And of course, we all strive to add realism and detail to our layouts, so we'll share some secrets and techniques that will help you make your operation look more authentic. And when you see this graphic, pay attention because it tells you the name of a computer file stored on this DVD, including additional details and techniques for creating and improving your layout. Let's get rolling as we bring the action, power, and creativity of model railroading to life in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Suppose that it's 1950 and the Milwaukee Road and the Chicago Northwestern Railroads have merged. Now suppose that they run their colorful passenger trains through the rolling hills and farmland of southwestern Wisconsin. Sound like a fantasy? Perhaps. But it's fact. On the N-Gage Chicago, Milwaukee and Northwestern Railroad of John Schoenenberg. The result of over 25 years of planning and construction. It started back in 1947 in tiny New Glarus, Wisconsin. When I was four and a half years old, my grandparents, who lived in New Glarus, Wisconsin, gave me an American Flyer train set. My uncle purchased it at the New Glarus hardware store. When I opened that train, I was elated. Um, it was the most wonderful gift I had ever received. Uh, my father and I set it up and we ran it around the Christmas tree, and we ran it several times a year. He was quite protective of the train set, knew it was kind of a valuable toy, and so he didn't run it too often. About the time John was 14, he and a friend discovered a book that would prove to be instrumental in his love of model railroading. When I was about 14 years old, uh, I met a friend on the school bus going to high school. Uh, his name was Jay Corey, and he and I were both interested in model railroading. And he recommended a book written by Frank Ellison. Uh, it was a book that was published in 1954. It was just 154 pages, but it explained everything that you needed to know to uh, build and operate a model railroad. I decided that uh, I would use the tools and the methods that Frank Ellison uh, illustrated in his, in his book. So I built uh, the mountains and the scenery out of uh, wire screen and plaster. I scratch built some buildings. I remember building uh, a meat packing plant, an oil depot, uh, refrigeration uh, uh, ice plant and uh, a power plant. But as a young student, John didn't have the time or the place to do much more than continue to scratch build structures. And a chance passing of a hobby shop in the late 1960s introduced him to Engage. I was an intern in uh, dentistry in Buffalo, New York, and uh, I was walking down the street one day and I passed a hobby shop and there was a, an end scale set in the window. It was a very beautiful Pennsylvania E8 uh, with four River Rossi uh, heavyweight passenger cars. I lived in apartments for many years early on and um, there isn't a lot of room in an apartment so I decided on end scale. John had a dream to someday continue that layout he had as a child and in 1976 that opportunity finally presented itself, and he modeled what he remembered. Well, most of my life I've lived in this area. I lived uh, uh, most of my years in Milwaukee, but I've lived in Fond du Lac, spent uh, time in New Glarus, Wisconsin, and uh, so I remember this area uh, from my childhood days. John started building his scenery using plaster-soaked paper towels and progressed through styrofoam and plaster cloth. But the scenery isn't the only thing that's hand-built on this layout. His buildings are also specially constructed. I take uh, kits, uh, building kits, and uh, maybe two or three of the same kit or varying kits, and I kit bash those into buildings that fit the space that I have and that I require to uh, have buildings in. Structures aren't the only things that are kit bashed. John does rolling stock as well. This is my workshop where I build all of the uh, rolling stock for my railroad, especially the passenger cars. Here I'm going to be fabricating a Milwaukee Road 10-6 sleeper. Uh, I purchased the car sides from a manufacturer in Canada, and then I use uh, an American Limited core kit 
which uh, supplies the, the roof and the underbody details and the ends. And from that I build up the passenger car, put on the proper trucks. Using a digital command control system is a far cry from that first layout. And it allows John the opportunity to escape from the ordinary into a very rewarding world. Well, when I'm working on the layout, uh, everything, all my concerns and all of my worries and everything leaves. Um, I'm totally at peace when I'm working on my layout. Uh, it involves uh, carpentry, it involves artistic work, it involves scratch building, it involves electrical work, electronics. Uh, it's all very, very enjoyable. The Chicago, Milwaukee, and Northwestern Railroad really started over half a century ago, and it lives on as a tribute to the ambitions and craftsmanship of John Schunenberg, who started with a train under a tree in a small town in Wisconsin. Injection molded plastic kits have been a part of model railroading for many years. Over the decades, the quality level and detail has increased dramatically. And in recent years, snap together kits have become a part of the structure kit line. A lot of these kits are designed with innovative techniques such as having the window glazing and the door and window trim detail molded as one unit. And the parts are designed with limited filing and sanding needed. This particular kit as you can see, has the trim and the windows as separate pieces molded in realistic colors. To separate these parts from the sprue, I'll use two tools, the sprue nippers and the sprue cutters. The green tabs here can be cut with the sprue nippers. So I'll just go in like this. You can hear the snap there and that. Now for the tan pieces, I'll need the sprue nipper or the sprue cutters. And those are for the thicker parts. So I'll just go in behind like this. And you want to get as close as you can to the sprue. You just go like that. And the part just comes free. Now, no matter how close you get to the part, you're going to need to do a little bit of filing. And I like to keep a set of dedicated plastic files on hand. And the reason you want to have a set of plastic files is that if you use these same files to work with metal, you're going to get metal burrs into the teeth of the file which will scratch the plastic and ruin the part. So I'll just go ahead and just gently file on there. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort and you just want to do a little bit of work, check, do a little more work and check again so you don't get little dips in the part and that then you'll have to go back and try to fill those in so it's easier just to file and check, file and check until the part looks good. Like that. So that looks pretty good. And now with the filing done, we're ready to add the window glazing. And as I was mentioning earlier, you can see how the pieces have the window glazing and the detail already molded as one unit. And then the holes are pre-drilled, so you can go ahead and put those right onto the part. That, and then it presses in. You can let the pressure alone hold the part in place. But I prefer to add a little bit of glue just to make sure the part is secure. So I use a plastic compatible glue. And you don't need a whole lot for this. You just want to just get right around the peg. You don't want to get any on the part of the glass that's visible. Otherwise, it's going to show up as a marred streak on the glass. So you just carefully go along there. And that should be sufficient to hold the part in place. Now we'll put the front of the building on. And the corners are already beveled, as you can see. So it just slips right into place, which is really handy. Then just take a little more of our glue. And we'll just work it into the corner and let, let the the capillary action just pull the glue into the joint. So you really don't need to load the brush up that much. And that should be sufficient to hold the front wall in place. This particular brand of glue here is a very rapid setting glue, which is good for a kit like this. There are also liquid plastic cements that are available. They also work well on these kind of kits, but they take a little more time to dry. So depending on how much time you have, you can either go with the rapid set or the little bit slower setting glues. 
With the walls assembled, we'll go ahead and start work on the second story. These kits come with a little base like this that mounts on the pegs here. So just set that on. And that's just going to rest on there. And then again, we'll go back to our 10 axe glue. And we'll just put a little, a little dollop of glue on the, in the holes here. And we'll just catch a little along this front edge here. And we'll go along the sides a little bit. You don't want to build the glue up too much on this edge because the second story of the building, the walls rest along this edge. So you want to make the glue lay as smooth as, and as flat as possible so you don't have any undulations that are going to affect how the, build, the second floor seats. With the uh, second floor base on, the next step is to make sure that the light doesn't penetrate from the second floor down to the first floor. This particular kit comes with some paper, just basic black uh, construction type paper. And all we're going to do is take some of this tacky glue here. And we're just going to brush it along the edges of the floor. So we'll just take a little bit, work it along. It doesn't take a whole lot to hold the paper in place. And once this glue is clear, then you know it's tacky and ready to hold the paper in place. Okay. And this, this glue is pretty quick drying. As you can see, it's already clear. So we'll just go ahead and we'll set the paper on like so. You want to be sure that the pegs are left open. You can just go around and smooth out the joints like that and, and then it's set. Another technique that's used is just a little four-way four divider. I've already made one here out of the construction paper that comes with the, the kit. And you just cut little slats in it so that they can sit together. So you just go like this and then we'll slide it in and then it would go like that on the building, then you'd put the walls around, and that would prevent any light from crossing through the building and makes it look like the building is occupied and that there are walls inside the structure, even though, in fact, there aren't. Even though plastic kits are molded in realistic colors, it still helps to add a little wash or a little paint to them to, them to add realism. One technique, particularly for trim pieces, is to spray them with a dull coat. This helps take down the shine and it gives the part a little bit of a weathered look. Another technique I like to use is to coach acrylic paint into the mortar lines. Since this kit is, is a tan color, I'm going to use a, a regular concrete paint. So this is gray. Now with paints like this, it's always important to stir and never to shake the paint. If you shake the paint, you're going to get paint residue up along this lip. And when that dries, it's very tough to open the jar of paint. So you just want to go in, stir it, and make sure that you have all the pigments off the base. And this looks pretty good already. So I'll just go ahead and set my mixing stick down. And then what I do is I'll pick up a little bit of paint. We'll just go in, load up the brush about like that. Then we'll dunk it in the water, take a little bit of the paint paint off. Then we we'll just go ahead and start by brushing the paint into the joints, into the mortar lines. And just take a little more water and you can see how it's just filling in along the mortar lines. And you just keep going along the building, all the sides, using the same technique until you're done. Now depending on what color the structure is, you may need to change colors. Sometimes you'll need to go with an aged concrete or even a white that'll help highlight the mortar line details. And when you're through, you can take a pencil eraser and go over the face of the bricks. And this will make the bricks still their original color, but it'll highlight them, it'll bring the mortar detail out a bit more. And I have a finish kit here. And as you can see how the mortar detail looks, and it really 
pops out the details. And there are a few spots where the, where the mortar didn't go in, but you know, it looks like it's been repaired or it might be some newer brick detail in there. These snap together kits are a great way to add structures to your layout in a hurry and they're easy to build and make a fun weekend or couple evening project. Imagine steam engines making their way up a mountain with grades as steep as 37 percent. This unique railroad is located in New Hampshire's beautiful Mount Washington. Well, what makes this railroad different than mainline railroads is a rail in the center of the two rails called a cog rack. And that rack is made of two pieces of angle iron connected by spools. And underneath the engine are two large gears that climb in that rack. It began with a fellow named Sylvester Marsh. In 1858, he climbed this mountain and ran into a terrible storm and was driven into shelter, decided there must be a better way to ascend Mount Washington. So in the next few years, he came up with the idea for the Mount Washington Cog Railway, and eventually the plans appeared on the cover of Scientific America in 1864. Construction began in 1866, and they built the first quarter of a mile of track, and they were, they were able to get investors to come up and uh, actually prove that it would work. They ran a train up a little ways, stopped it, uh, used the brakes to safely come down, and then he was able to get funding to finish the railroad. In three years, they did make it all the way to the top, and it opened in 1869 for the tourist business. Well, in the past, the locomotives were built elsewhere. Now we design and construct them here. Uh, as far as the maintenance is concerned, uh, generally through the year, when the train is on the mountain, the engineers and firemen take care of the normal daily maintenance, loosening bolts and parts. Any actual broken pieces require the shop crew to look at it and determine what's needed, and then they'll do the machining or whatever's, whatever is needed to be done to the engine. We also have a, a car shop, and this year we built a, a large wooden car. It's the largest car we've had on this mountain so far, carrying 56 passengers and that was designed and constructed by a fellow here after this more or less the same design as the older cars. The first locomotive was originally named Hero and it was built in 1866 and delivered here and it was the engine that built this track. But if you look closely at it, the stack going up looks a lot like a pepper sauce bottle which was on the tables in many kitchens in the old days and someone noticed that and called it pepper sass and ever since then it's stuck. So now we, we call it by that name. Well, on a very clear day, you can see five states and also into Canada. Uh, the weather here is very unusual. It changes very rapidly sometimes. Uh, temperatures can drop 30 degrees in a matter of minutes, which catch a lot of uh, hikers in difficult situations. The trains uh, are heated, so we don't run into trouble when we have cold temperatures. However, in the cab where we're running the engine, we get quite a bit of wind, and we really get to feel the weather back there. On the early part of the running season and the late part of the running season, which is April and the very end of October, we have uh, generally quite a bit of snow blowing around here, and we still run the cars. We're able to make it, and then it closes for the season at that point. Uh, also, the winds here uh, can be extremely high. One of the highest winds recorded on Earth, as far as a surface station is concerned, was on the top of this mountain in 1934, and it blew at 231 miles an hour. Uh, at the base, um, below where the shops are, we have a transfer table, and on either side are two buildings. One houses all the cars, one houses all the engines and we back an engine onto the transfer and then move it back to the bay or stall that we want to put the engine in or car and then if it's an engine we can back it in usually with steam if it's a car you usually get a bunch of guys and and push it right in uh, also we have on this line three switches and uh, one's at the base and then there's two on the mountain that divide the track into three equal parts 
which allow us to run hourly trains. And those switches are at this point the most complicated in the world. Uh, they have 10 pieces that have to be individually hand thrown. And each time two trains pass, we have to throw that switch four times. So it's uh, quite a job for the brakeman. Uh, I think the future looks good. Uh, more and more people are interested in steam power. And uh, the railroad is building uh, new equipment all the time. And it's been here since 1869 and still running. So I think it has a, a good future ahead. Like so many of us, Homer Henry fell in love with trains when he was just a boy back in the 1950s. He would sit on his grandmother's porch in La Follette, Tennessee, and watch the cars of the Louisville and Nashville rumble by. So it was no real surprise when Homer Henry began a career with the Santa Fe in California. He went from brakeman to engineer to manager to executive. But even as a busy executive, Homer Henry found time to pursue his love of model railroading. He became a master craftsman and modeler and planned for the day when he would build his dream layout. Finally, and with the help of others, that dream turned real. In his Illinois home is a magnificent American Flyer S-gauge layout created for him by a company called the Model Train Works. The Great Smoky Mountain Railway rolls through the Tennessee countryside. So I had this track plan drawn up for some time using one of the new computer track making programs that were existed in the uh, late 80s. And I drew this up at that time and uh, was waiting for the right combination of time and, and uh, place. So by moving into this location in 1990, <coughs> I uh, started looking around and found a, uh, an ad in Model Railroader about this fellow from the model, model train works, I believe it was called. And he had an 800 number, and it was a very interesting little story, because he had an 800 number, and I called it, and I had no idea where he was at in the country. So I was just talking to him over the phone, we talked about what I wanted to do. He said he normally built the layouts on location and moved it to where uh, the client was. We talked for about 20 minutes about concepts, scenery, no grades, or some little grades, et cetera. And finally, after 20 minutes of the conversation, I said, so where are you located at? So I can look at transportation costs, you can come see where I'm at. And he says, well, I live in Naperville, Illinois. And it turned out he was five minutes from where I lived. <laughs> so he came over, we, we hung up and he came over and we started the uh, project in about a week after that or two weeks after that. Homer and his wife also have a 10 by 40 foot HO gauge layout with incredible scenery. This, too, was assembled with the help of admired professionals. It's a um, high degree of concentration, creativity, um, artistic uh, value that uh, goes into the contribution of, of making it such a, a fun, fun experience. It's, um, it's interesting, though, when people come and look at both layouts that the American Flyer really tends to be more of an interest than all the extreme detail that's in the HO layout because of the noise it makes, the smoke of the engines, um, the excitement that it brings back of the Christmas mornings that we've all had that during this hobby of uh, the big trains running around in a circle. And then the serious people like to look at the HO layout, but they all sort of drift back to this one and look at the flyer. It's very exciting, it's a lot of noise. Um, it's hard to even talk in here when they're all running. But the HO was uh, the, uh, the epic of uh, bringing together all the different functions of detail and craftsmanship and all that. So it's two completely separate things. Homer Henry now manages two of his own companies, one that certifies locomotive engineers, and a company called Railtech Productions, which helps produce train scenes for television commercials and the movie industry. Railtech Productions has offices in Chicago, Kansas City, and Beverly Hills, California. And that uh, company works with the movie industry, uh, not only for feature films, but also commercials, TV shows, that uh, <clears throat> require trains. Almost anything that has trains in it, our company's involved in getting the trains and the Hollywood production company together. Homer Henry is a man who's been able to take a childhood love of trains 
and turn it into both an exciting career and a fulfilling hobby. A fortunate man who's never drifted far from those dreams on his grandmother's porch. Today I'm going to talk a little about the basics of N-scale model railroading. You're looking at the Carolina Central, a layout the model railroader staff built several years ago. It's built on a bedroom door, so it's only about six and a half feet across and two and a half feet deep. As you can see, you can pack a lot of railroading into a small space. On the flip side, if you have a lot of space for your model railroad, you can build scenery in N-scale that dominates your trains, just like in real life. N-scale layouts, just like HO scale layouts, can be run on direct current or digital command control. They can be large and complicated or simple, just like this Carolina Central layout. N-scale got started in the 1960s with a company called Arnold Rapido. It made its way to the United States, and I vividly recall a friend of mine in high school who had an N-scale layout in the 1970s. N-scale is one 160th the size of real trains. As you can see, N-scale is at roughly half the size of HO. Here's an HO tank car. Here's an N-scale tank car. Here's an HO locomotive. Here's an N-scale locomotive. An easy way to gauge the size of N-scale is by measurement. A typical N-scale 40-foot boxcar is actually about three inches long. The name N-scale comes from the gauge of the track. There are nine millimeters between the rails, which translates to about three-eighths of an inch. Just like an HO scale, track comes in a variety of sections with and without roadbed. Here's an atlas section with ties, Bachman with roadbed, and lifelike with roadbed. Typically, the rails are connected by rail joiners, just like an HO scale, although this lifelike section has metal contact points between each piece. Flex track is also available in N gauge, just like an HO. And turnouts can be simple, like this basic Atlas electrically powered turnout, or something far more sophisticated, like this Cottle crossover. Just like an HO track, N-scale track comes in different rail heights. This is a code 80 turnout from Atlas, and this is a code 55 turnout from Atlas. And as you can see, the code 55 rails look far more realistic, but you do have to be careful that your rolling stock and locomotives use wheel sets that can accommodate the lower rail height of code 55 track. Detail-wise, N-scale locomotives have come a long way in recent years. This Bachman 280 locomotive features details that rival many HO scale locomotives. It also features traction tires that assist in climbing grades with longer trains, something that older N scale steam locomotives with all metal wheels lack. DCC and sound systems are also available in some N scale locomotives. This Athern Challenger, which was introduced recently, contains a full sound system and digital command control straight from the factory. This Cotto F3 diesel locomotive is designed to accommodate a decoder right inside its shell. Today's N-scale locomotives can be as fully featured as their larger HO scale cousins. N-scale locomotives and rolling stock have been produced with two different styles of couplers. The original style, the Rapido couplers, work fine, but they don't look very realistic. In recent years, knuckle couplers have become very popular. They work well and they look far more realistic. As you can see on the front of these two F3 locomotives, the two couplers are incompatible with each other. Today you can buy replacement knuckle couplers for rolling stock and locomotives that originally came with Rapido couplers. These couplers from microtrains are available already assembled or in separate components. This locomotive from Atlas originally came with a Rapido coupler. It has been converted to a knuckle coupler using the appropriate style of coupler and a hole was drilled for the attachment screw. All that's needed besides the coupler and its components are a pin vise and the appropriate size drill bit. On freight cars, the conversion from Rapido style couplers to knuckle style couplers is easier. You can purchase already made couplers and trucks as a component. Since almost all N-scale freight cars use truck mounted couplers 
and it's just a matter of removing the center pin and replacing it with the appropriate truck and coupler combination. You can check your work with a, with a coupler gauge by lining it up and as you can see this one is in good gauge. You also should have the ability to change out wheel sets should you wish to use code 55 rail as I mentioned earlier. Here we have a metal wheel set, uh, a typical code 80 wheel set with larger flanges, and a code 55 wheel set with smaller flanges. When I first became interested in end scale, I was concerned that I don't have the eyesight I did when I was a teenager and that I wouldn't be able to see the small details necessary to work in the scale. Well, I was wrong. For general use, I just wear a good pair of reading glasses. For close-up work, I wear an OptiVisor. These come in different magnifications. You wear them like a pair of sunglasses. In the down position, your vision is magnified, and in the up position, you see normally. When I'm at the workshop, I can use a magnifier like this. Or if I need an extra hand, I can use a magnifier like this one with alligator clips and an adjustable magnifying lens. Also, you'll need an assortment of smaller scale tools, such as these jeweler screwdrivers and lots of different tweezers. There are big advantages to working in end scale, especially for someone who doesn't have a lot of space in their home or somebody who wants scenery large and dominant over their trains. So don't let the small size of end scale turn you off. This is the Tropicana Juice Train, loaded with orange juice. It's headed for stores in your neighborhood, straight from Florida. If you've ever had the opportunity to see the train go by, it's an awesome sight. You know, the train at some point in time can be up to a mile long in total, and it's a stream of orange cars with Tropicana written on the side of it. So that sight in itself is pretty exciting, no matter if it's going out the door or it's coming in your door. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The story really starts at the Tropicana plant in Bradenton, Florida, where the oranges take the first step in their long but swift journey to your glass. First thing you should know is that the fruit is harvested you know, from the months of October through June every year. And they come in in raw form as an orange itself in uh, trailer loads. These trailer loads are then picked up, uh, put into our sorting and cleaning operation on a daily basis, seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. And they go through a process of being able to be sorted into different sizes. And as a result of being put into different sizes, then they're put into the operation of actually being cut in half and reamed or extracting the juice from that standpoint. The product is packaged in many different varieties. We have approximately 300 to 350 SKUs or shipping units that we have. Uh, they're all palletized. And then from a palletization process, they move into our warehousing operation. Now, in a warehousing operation, we have two courses to move the product out the door. We put it in trucks going directly to some of our customers in the southeast area here in the United States from Florida or on our train. And our train takes the product directly to our New Jersey facility and our Cincinnati facility. Since CSX and Tropicana have been doing business for almost 30 years together, it's really maybe the last two years that we became partners in this relationship and really trying to find ways to help each other to move forward. They're trying to find ways to make sure that the cars are safe. To try to find ways to increase the speed and cut down on the cycle time it takes to move the cars from Jersey City back here and also from here up to Cincinnati and that whole network of moving the cars. Uh, we own and operate 353 cars right now and we turn those cars approximately three times a month. Without the help of CSX and, and the cooperation of the Tropicana employees, turning them at that rate would never happen. Uh, to my knowledge, that's about three times the industry average. When you look at this juice train, you should also think of the Pacific Fruit Express. If not for the PFE, the juice train would never have been born. Pacific Fruit Express was one of a number of transcontinental perishable handling organizations founded by E.A. Chairman at the time when SP and UP were one. And it was really to provide a transcontinental shipment of perishables to the East Coast where everybody lived in the early part of the century, 20th century. This train is a long-time East Coast fixture between Florida and New Jersey. 
Historian Anthony Thompson wrote a book called Pacific Fruit Express about the train that was a regular fixture on the West Coast. He says it was more than just another train. It was a big deal. I was struck in doing the research that oranges were Christmas presents in the early part of the 20th century. And when you got pears in the market or peaches or anything like that, it was for just a few weeks, and that was all there would be. And people were accustomed to that, but it meant that both fruits and vegetables that we take for granted practically year-round today just weren't available in, in those days. Part of it's transportation and part of it is storage and broader crop seasons and those aspects as well. The Pacific Fruit Express train brought folks what was then rare produce. The train is still by far the best way to move the juice, much better than trucks. And you know how you see some trains sort of poking along, rocking their way to some distant destination? Not the juice train. It really hammers along the route. The best way to look at the, the railroad advantage that we have is that it brings speed into our system. And in reality, speed and volume together. And that's a unique thing for us. We have such a high consumption of orange juice in our northeast and now into our Midwest area that to put the volume of trucks on the road to accomplish that would be just monumental. And what the train brings to us is a two-day delivery or cycle time into the northeast and the Midwest. And additionally, you know, a huge amount of volume moving at one point in time. Each railroad car equates to about three and a half truckloads of product. So do the math. If we're shipping 50 to 60 carloads, you can imagine how many additional truckloads that would have to be. And since we're talking numbers, how about the fact that this Tropicana plant covers 268 acres? 68 of those acres are under one roof with 3,200 people at this facility. More numbers? How about a fleet of more than 300 refrigerated boxcars? How about two trains, one with 45 cars that make six trips a week between Florida and New Jersey, and another train called the Midwest Juice Train with 30 cars making two trips between Florida and Cincinnati? And, if that isn't enough, the Tropicana plant uses 4 million oranges a day. And that equates to approximately 400 truckloads of product a day coming into our facility and being processed. And then on the outbound side, we're looking at maybe 200 truckloads of finished product going out the door, along with another 45 to 50 railroad cars of product. And the train brings a neat thing to us. It's, it's a concept because you know, people get excited about seeing a train go by. You know, sometimes when you have to wait for the train to go by, you're not so excited. Uh, but the other side is that it is a, a major monumental feat on a daily basis to pull anywhere from 45 to 70 cars out of this lot and do that anywhere from six to seven times a week. And just think, it's all because people love their orange juice. And, and you're waiting for something really good. I mean, the fact of the matter is that in the New York metro market, we're the number one selling item in the grocery store. So when that train arrives, every grocery train is looking forward to that shipment. So next time you grab a carton of juice, remember the juice train. If you think about it, it's carrying more than just juice. It's carrying tradition and history. Think back to the old days when juice was cooled with ice on the trains of the PFE. Well, I think the, the key in, in a fleet like Pacific Fruit Express was that refrigerator cars were specialized and expensive, and most railroads didn't want to buy them because for that four to six week peach season, you didn't want to own cars that sat around the rest of the year. But Southern Pacific and Union Pacific, with their huge territory, with such different climates and different parts of it, could keep the cars busy most of the year. You know, you had potatoes late in the fall, and pretty soon you have oranges in California in the winter, and, and so on throughout the whole crop year. So they could make use of a large fleet, and they had the largest in the country, in a way that individual smaller railroads could, could never have done. And I was used uh, until a surprisingly late uh, time, 1972 is when it was discontinued. And the real reason for that is ice is cheap and it's very effective because when ice melts, it really absorbs a lot of heat. It really took a lot of heat out of the produce. So you could even put warm produce from the field into the cars and that melting ice would very rapidly suck up the heat. And that really was something you could not do with mechanical refrigeration for a long time. In fact, today you, you can't do it. Air doesn't have the same kind of ability to remove the heat. But today, shippers will cool the produce out of the field before they put it into the shipment cars, or trucks as they often are today. Those old images are just an older version of these. The thing they have in common is trains. So the next time you grab some orange juice, think of where it came from, how it got there, 
and how, in your own small way, you're playing a part in history, the history of the juice train. I got interested in garden railroading uh, primarily because it was outside where real trains are found. That's where trains belong outside. I'd spent uh, 12 years restoring actual real railroad hardware up at the Railroad Museum in Campo and uh, that experience led to this. And I like real railroading and this is as close as I'm going to get that I can do easily in the backyard. It's a heck of a lot of fun and it's a great stress relief from uh, my normal career as an architect which is a, a high stress deadline pressured job. And I like to run my model railroad the way the prototype would. Basically it goes from point A to point B and uh, meets other trains in between. And that's how I like to uh, indoctrinate other people when they're designing their railroads so that the operational possibilities are maximized. You plan a layout very much the way the prototype would do it if they're negotiating through some rugged country. You look for the most economical way to move through it, especially if you're negotiating with a property owner like your wife who has an established garden that she's not real happy about uh, having to move out of the way for things. And you plan a railroad very much from that point of view. You're looking for things to uh, overcome, uh, but not unreasonable ones. If you have stuff that looks uh, so preposterous in your railroad that uh, there's an obvious answer of not doing it right adjacent, uh, to me, that doesn't make any sense. It, uh, it violates my sense of prototypical correctness to do anything that's uh, gymnastically uh, too theatrical. Oh, my husband has to negotiate with me any time uh, he wants to do anything. Remember, he came uh, into my garden, which was well established. It had ferns, everything well established. And when I first heard what he wanted to do, I said, you want to do what with my garden? And then he says, but think of the spoiling you can get. I says, well, on second thought, this might be nice. My hobby is that of uh, an active helper with my husband. I do the gardening aspect, and my husband, of course, does the railroading. I like to emphasize the fact that this is a family-oriented hobby. In fact, the Garden Railway Society I belong to stresses this, that youngsters can get involved with this, as well as mama and dad and grandma and grandpa. I very much like it for that aspect. My title is um, Roadmaster, and that includes maintenance of way. I'm the one that uh, cleans the track and uh, trims all the, uh, the baby tears away from the track so that it is smooth running. I'm also in charge of the aesthetics of the, the basic railroad. We've come at the wrong time of the year, I guess, uh, if to really uh, show my railroad at its best. The plants I use are basically from the nursery. I like to use small leaved herbs like uh, lemon scented thyme. I use a sweet alyssum. I use uh, dwarf star creeper. And uh, what I like is the fact that one does not necessarily have to use bonsai, which can be quite expensive. Um, so therefore, you, you can put as much money or as little money as you want to into your garden plantings. I protect these plants by using what is called a floating row cover. In commercial gardening, this has been used for years, but this has been a relatively recent opportunity for us who are just ordinary garden railroaders to have this. And uh, it protects against frost, pounding rain, hail. It, it sort of softens the temperature underneath the, uh, the cover so your plants are not harmed in any way. Everything that uh, I need to run this locomotive, for instance, is right here. And uh, all I need to do is turn it on like this and turn the transmitter on. It's real simple. Coil in forward and reverse. There's the bell. I'm not tethered to a control panel. I don't have to do any wiring to the railroad. I don't have to worry about polarity problems uh, that you do on an ordinary indoor model railroad. I don't do any of that stuff. It's, it's instant gratification. It's the American way. Everything that traditional American railroading had and did, I want to do on the models. And it's just uh, the perfect kinetic sculpture to uh, get your jollies off in a, in a tremendous uh, artistic uh, uh, extravaganza, as you will, depending on how elaborate you're going to get outside. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about one of the most popular brands of locomotives that we have in the HO model railroading field. 
And these are the diesel locomotives that are made by the Athern Company. And they've been producing these models for pretty close to 50 years these days. The thing about their locomotives is they've always been a very good value and their locomotives are almost indestructible over the years. They run and run and run for decades. For example, this Ohio Southern engine from my own layout has been running for pretty close to 25 years. And other than needing an occasional tune-up, it's done just fine. This is the same locomotive in the current version which only has a couple of slight modifications to make it even better than the original one was 25 years ago. The thing about the Athern engines is they all have a reputation for very smooth operation and generally very quiet operation. But once in a while we get a noisy one and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how to troubleshoot and take care of those problems. Uh, the Athern diesels all have a similar construction and on the older engines by spreading the sides you can get over the pins that hold it into the body shell and you can take the mechanism out of the locomotive. And all of the Athern diesels use the combination with the plastic body shell and then they have either the older engines have wire side handrails and grab irons. The newer ones have these parts made out of a engineering plastic that's very flexible and strong. The mechanism is entirely self-contained and is a geared drive with a DC motor in the middle. The newer engines all have flywheels and then they have a power truck at each end that drives all the wheels on the locomotive. The newer style of the SD40 locomotive is made the same way except instead of using the pins on the side they use a draft gear box mounted with a screw at each end that goes through the pilot to hold the body on the chassis. Now that we have the shell off of the locomotive, the next step is to take a look at the mechanical parts to make sure all of the pieces are put together properly. But sometimes things get dislodged in shipment across the country. So we start out by putting the locomotive on the track and just testing it to see if it runs and listen to it, see if there's any unusual sounds or noises that we should be aware of, and try it in both directions. And sometimes it's a good idea to even try, just hold the engine and let it run, see how the mechanism sounds. Then the next thing we check on it is the gauge of the wheels because it's very difficult to get an engine to operate if the wheels are not engaged all the way through the locomotive. And to take care of that, we use a special tool they sell in the hobby shop called the National Model Railroad Association Standards Gauge. And we use that, there's two little notches in the side of it that fit onto the wheel set so we can see if they fit into the grooves. If the wheels fit into the notches in the gauge, the wheel set is fine and we can put it on the layout that way. If the wheels don't match the gauge, then we have to do some more work and take them apart and re-gauge the wheels so that they do match the gauge. As if the wheels are too close together, when they go around the layout, they'll hit guardrails in the switches and chances are they'll derail. If they're too wide in gauge, they'll find every little per imperfection in your track work as they go around. So if we find that a wheels or, or even several wheel sets are out of gauge, then we need to take the truck completely off of the locomotive. And by working a screwdriver in along the sides, we'll prop the cover plate off of the truck so that we can get to the wheel sets that are inside the truck. 
And the wheel sets can be lifted out so that we can work on the individual ones. Now with the wheel set out, we can then twist it with our fingers either direction to bring it in tighter or to spread it out until the wheel set fits the gauge properly. Because if the wheel set doesn't fit, we've got a problem. And as we do this adjusting of the gauge, we want to make sure that we don't pin either one of the bearings that are on either side of the gear. Because if we pinch the, the bearing, the engine will have trouble turning that axle. Now with the wheel set adjusted for the proper gauge, we can put it back together and drop it back in the truck. And then we may have to turn either or both bearings until they drop in flat as this one is. Once the bearings are back in place, the cover plate just lays on top and snaps back into position to hold the whole thing together. And then the truck is ready to go back on the locomotive and we can go on to the next step. Now it's time to check the electrical path of the current through the locomotive. So we'll put the truck aside for now and let's look at one of the regular locomotives the way they come from the factory. Now the Athern diesels use the frame of the locomotive for one side of the circuit. The second side of the circuit is through the truck underneath and it comes up through the middle of the locomotive on both ends and then this strap across the top carries the second part of the current through the locomotive. So the current's picked up on one side of the truck, goes through that side of the truck, the frame of the locomotive to the motor, up through the motor to this, and then back to the other side, second rail. Now, on older locomotives, these connections where it's strictly the two steel pieces touching each other sometimes get corroded. And over time, they begin to create a high resistance that doesn't pass much current. And the locomotive will start losing speed and start acting up as though it's running on very dirty track. To improve the electrical contacts on the older engines, I removed the original metal strap from the locomotive. So let's take a look at one that I've already done the work on. We start with the original strap, cut both ends off, so we just have the piece that fits in the middle. Then I solder a piece of flexible wire in the middle of that, so it'll snap onto the top of the motor to give us a good connection there. Then I take the wire, loop it around at each end, here and over here, to make the connect both truck connections. And on this particular one, I soldered the connections to the wire, and that gives me a good solid contact all the way through the locomotive. The only problem with doing that is any time you want to take the truck off, you have to unsolder the wire. To get around that, Radio Shack sells little clips that they call flag disconnects, which are little metal clips that will slip right onto those connections. And you can solder the wire into that. This piece will slide on and off so that anytime you need to take the truck off, you can just pull the connection loose and take the truck out. You don't have to unsolder anything. Now, once the connections have been made to the trucks, the locomotive now has complete electrical circuit again. We can put it back on the track and test run it to see how it performs. Now, some of the older engines may have trouble getting started because there's corrosion on the armature of the locomotive. So to clean that up, we wind up using little emery boards like the ladies use to trim their fingernails. The only thing we need to do is cut a little strip of it because it has to be small enough to fit in to the motor 
So we can run the locomotive and then very gently use the emery board to polish the surface of the commutator. And you can see the color of the commutator will change from black to a very bright copper color as the cleaning takes place. And usually the engine picks up a little bit of speed like this one did because it's getting better electrical contact. Now we can also use a variety of commercial cleaners which we just apply with the uh, good old cotton swab that are made for electronic cleaning like tuner cleaner for television sets. And you just spray a little bit of that on the Q-tip and hold it against the commutator and you'll hear the engine pick up speed as it gets rid of the oil that's on that surface. It's one of the problems we have with most locomotives is they're over lubricated and too much lubrication on the motor bearings winds up being thrown off and it often will end up on the commutator where it burns up as the motor runs. Okay, the last part of putting the locomotive back together is getting the body shell on. And one of the things we have to make sure of is that all the wiring in that we've added is in the middle of the engine. So that when we put the body shell on, there isn't anything that's touching the inside of the body shell. But you get some very strange noises that way. So we slip the body shell back onto the locomotive Make sure it's seated all the way. You can usually hear a click like that when it goes on. And then try it and see what it sounds like. Because if there's anything touching the body, it acts like a big drum and you can hear a lot of noise then. Then once the body shell is back on, then it's just a matter of sliding the couplers in from each end and putting the screws in from underneath to hold it all together. The last thing we need to check then, after the engine's back together again, is to see if the wheels need cleaning. And if they do, if they're really dirty, we can use an, the same little abrasive stick we had before, and we can run the locomotive using test leads and just lightly touch each wheel tread until it gets shiny. The other thing we can use an abrasive eraser that they call a bright boy which is also a, an abrasive surface and you lightly touch that to the wheels until it cleans the wheel surface off. And When the wheels are all bright and shiny the locomotive is ready to go and you put it back on the track and you're in business for another year. The important thing is as you do these minor tune-up operations, you eliminate all the problems that cause the locomotive to run erratically and you can restore even an old locomotive to very smooth operation to put in many more miles on your model railroad. In Pennsylvania Dutch country, Amish farm stretches far as the eye can see. In Strasbourg, it's the railroad which reminds us we really are in the 20th century. But you will find that both the simpler time and our modern time coexist comfortably here at a place called the Choo Choo Barn. The Choo Choo Barn houses more than a model train layout. It houses 1,700 square feet of fantasy. There are more than 135 animated figures that bring this layout to life. There is a baseball game and the winning run is on third while the pitcher is in the stretch. The circus is in town, and there's excitement under the big top. The zoo is open, and the elephants are on display. And the giant giraffes are in a stretch of their own. See the death-defying acts of the daredevils that fly high on the trapeze. The Amish barn building appears to be going smoothly. 
The men work in sweat. The women get the lunch ready. It's very busy in Strasbourg, where the trains arrive and depart at the station eight hours a day, every day. Wait a minute. Call for help. There's a fire. But all will be safe. This major tourist attraction was 50 years in the making, ever since hometown boy George Groff decided the simple layout he put together for his kids in 1945 was growing out of control and attracting more visitors than one house and one family could handle. In 1961, he moved his trains here to what was then just an old barn. Actually, he didn't re move the layout per se, but he built a, a layout here, uh, 500 square feet with six trains and six animations, and opened up the Choo Choo Barn on Thanksgiving Day of 1961. Uh, well, little did we know that you know things would, would continue this long, but over the next, well now we're going into our 35th year uh, here at the Choo Choo Barn. We've never moved, we've stayed in the same building. Um, we, like I said, we started with six trains, we now have 17 trains. We started with six animated figures, we now have over 135 different little animated figures and vehicles all over the display. Some of the scenes are decades old, some are brand new, but all are close to home. The interesting you know, part about our display is we use a lot of local color. We've been able to take a model railroad display and theme it to Lancaster County. And on our layout, you'll see uh, a miniature of Dutch Warner Land, which is an amusement park here in Lancaster County, a miniature of uh, the Red Caboose Lodge, a miniature of Strasburg Railroad. We have an Amish barn raising. We have the typical uh, Amish uh, horse and buggies all over the layout and of course at one spot we have the horse and buggy with uh, a row of seven cars behind it like you'll see in just about any road around here in Lancaster County. All the motors and electrical parts are underneath the layout. All the animations are handmade and each has an individual motor. The whole idea of, a, of an animation is first you got to come up with an idea obviously and then after that idea uh, mushrooms about 55 times, you end up with a finished product. And the, my original idea was to make a playground with, obviously, a merry-go-round, a swing, and two seesaws, okay, which is basically like this. Okay? It's all route driven by one motor. And as you can well see underneath, okay, it's just a series of cams coming up. The motor um, is geared here, and a series of cams that runs the swing and the two seesaws and the motor its shaft itself runs the merry-go-round. Uh, my background is basically I guess a, uh, a tinker and a model railroader of sorts. Um, I don't have any kind of engineering degree or electrical degree of any kind. Uh, I just love to tinker. I read a lot of, of uh, magazines and books on mechanics and electronics, and I don't know a lot about electronics. I can follow a wiring diagram somewhat, but I tinker. Is this something any talented and committed model railroad enthusiast could build himself? Sure, if you have the determination, desire, and the 50 years it takes to do it. Weathering is an effective way to add interest to your plastic structure kits. When weathering, I like to use a variety of techniques, including using my hobby knife and sandpaper to add some texture to the surface of the kit, as well as using powdered pastels and paint washes to simulate things like rust and faded peeling paint. Today, I'll be working on the Cottage Grove School Kit. It's a very easy to build kit and straight out of the box, it makes a quaint, pristine structure that would work well with an early 20th century layout. However, on a more modern layout, most one-room schoolhouses, especially those you see today, are in varying states of dilapidation. So I'll show you how to turn this pristine structure into a realistic looking wreck. First, I'll talk a little bit about how this kit goes together. It was de it's designed mainly to be snapped together. Um, you have these tabs that fit into these slots and they snap in place like so. However, when I build these kits, I also like to reinforce the joints 
with some plastic cement. And that'll just make sure that the structure is sturdy and you won't have any problems down the road. So simply dip my micro brush into the plastic cement and apply it to the joints. And I do that throughout the assembly process of this type of kit. To actually begin weathering, the first thing I'll need to do is to make the, this wood, which is actually simulated by plastic in the kit, look old. Right out of the box, it's already molded in, the in a bright red color, which would look great for a new, freshly painted schoolhouse. However, the first thing we need to do is actually give this surface some tooth and make it look like the paint is actually peeling and perhaps some of the boards are even cracked. So the first thing I'll do is I'll take some coarse grit sandpaper and I'll actually rub it onto the surface of the wall and it'll actually dig in and start to take off some of that red color as well as abrade the surface and actually give it the texture of old wood. Another technique that I like to do is I'll actually use my hobby knife and I'll go in and I'll actually scribe along some of the lines that simulate the individual planks and curl my blade up a bit and that'll actually make it look like some of the, the clapperding is actually separating from the wall. Now once I've gone through and roughed up the surface and made a few broken boards the next thing I'll do is I'll apply the wall to the base that came with the kit. And for this step, I'm simply going to snap it in place. The next thing I'll do is I'll apply a series of paint washes to the, to the wall to give it the look of faded paint. Now all a wash is is a very thin layer of color. And I like this technique because it allows you to build up the color slowly. You could, let's say you just wanted to make it look like it was slightly aged. You could just add one layer of a wash and it would bring out some of the individual planks and some of the individual detail. Or in this case, if you want to make the structure look like it's a total wreck, you can apply a whole series of washes and actually really fade the paint. Now, for the washes that I use, I use a mixture of 10% acrylic paint and 90% isopropyl alcohol. In this case, 70% isopropyl alcohol. However, you can use any, any mixture that you'd like. If it looks like you're not getting enough color, you can add a little more paint. If it looks like the color's going on too heavily, you can add more thinner. So, the first thing I'll do is I'll start with a wash of brown. Um, so that I'm not going to make a mess, I'll actually put this mat underneath the structure because applying a paint wash can get a bit messy. So I'll grab my brown paint and I like to use a wide soft brush for this just because it, it allows the, the wash to actually to run easier down the wall. And I'll start from the top and just let that color run down the wall. Now after that dries, I'll follow it up with a black wash. Here's a wall that has dried. Uh, this is just the first, first cover of, of the brown wash. So I'll go ahead and I'll grab my grimy black wash and I'll add that to this section. You'll notice I'm applying the wash starting from the top and letting it run down over the wooden section of the wall. I'm also applying the wash to the stone foundation. And what that'll do is more of the wash color will actually go into the simulated mortar joints of the foundation and make them stand out a bit more. And here's an example of the wall that I've applied several washes to. Brown, then followed by grimy black. Now the next thing I'll show you, you're probably wondering about the windows. For this structure, would be a bit problematic if I were going to light it and wanted a new schoolhouse yet I wanted to change the color of the windows because the way this kit comes the glazing is already inside of the window frame. However, for this structure since it's abandoned these windows are going to be dirty. 
Um, they're going to be dingy on the inside, and I don't necessarily want them to be painted over opaque, but I do want them a little translucent. And you could use a mixture of white glue and paint that on the inside of the windows and let that dry, and that would glaze them over fine. Or you could just use Tester's Dull Coat or another matte finish, which will effectively fog over the windows. And then once that's dried, you can see the windows will be translucent and it'll look like they're dirty. Um, the next step that I'll do, I'll actually make some of the panes look broken, cracked, even like, you know, maybe a, a school child in the past or maybe the present has tried to throw a rock through the window. So the next thing I'll do is I'll take my hobby knife and to cut some cracks, I'll just draw the knife along the back of the window, like so. On the front of the window to do spiderweb cracks, I can even dig the point of the blade into the pane and give it a twist. And you can even cut through some of the mullions you really want to make a window look like it's ragged. And here you can see that just with a few strokes of my hobby knife, I was able to create this realistic effect. And the next thing, these are already on the sprue. I'll actually give these a grimy black wash while they're still on the sprue before I even install them. And another option if you're, if you're really concerned about if it looks like there's too much color going onto the window panes, um, you can use, simply use a thinner wash, or you can even use watercolors, and those will take longer to apply, but those won't adhere hardly at all to the, to the glazing. Next, I'll show you some techniques I use to weather the roof of a plastic kit like this. As you can see, right out of the box, it's shiny black plastic. Um, which inherently doesn't look very realistic. So even if you were to make this as a new structure, a wash would help greatly. However, again, we want to make this look like it's fairly dilapidated. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add some texture to this roof. And again, I'll take my hobby knife, and I'll actually follow some of the lines on the shingles Draw my knife across, dig in, and give it a twist so it looks like some of the shingles are actually peeling off the roof. And I can also do this along the top of the peak of the roof by digging in and prying up some of the material, which makes it look like some of these shingles are going to be ready to fly off during the next windstorm. Again, after I've gone through and textured the roof, you can also use sandpaper again and just give it, just abrade it a bit. And then again, once you have the, your texture in place, the next thing you can do is to go ahead and apply a series of washes. Again, I'll start with black. We'll add a bit of brown. And you can see the various colors. They'll give the roof a, a mottled, faded effect. So it looks like there are some, some parts of the roof, some of the shingles that are, are more worn than others and faded. And it, it looks, looks very realistic. I also like to use gray for a shingled roof, just to let that run down. And again, you can apply as many washes as you like once you get to the desired effect. And here's the other side, um, where again, I've applied several washes of those three various colors. You'll also notice 
that I took my knife and actually ran it across the bottom edge of the roof. Um, and again, this made it look like some of the roof had peeled away, some of the shingles had been blown off uh, during the many, many years that this abandoned structure had seen. Next, I'll apply some weathering to um, some of the details in the kit. One technique I like to use washes for is to create mortar lines. Or the, and this will simulate the look of the gray mortar between the bricks of this chimney. And for that, again, I'll use my gray wash. And the wash will run off the surface of the bricks and fill into the mortar joints. Next, I'll use some powdered pastels to make some of the metal details on the structure look rusty. And powdered pastels, they usually, you can get them in sticks like this. And you can mix your own rust color. This dark orange is pretty close. Or we'll add a little brown into that. I'm just scraping this off with my hobby knife. Here I've already glued the gutter on one side of the roof. I mix my pastels. Just run them along the bottom. If you get anywhere you don't want them, Wipe them off with a damp cloth. And then you can just seal the powder with a light mist of Tester's Dull Coat, or again, any other matte finish. And I'll also apply some rust. Here's the cupola of the schoolhouse. And ideally, I should have applied the, the pastel powder before I put the bell in. Unfortunately, I forgot to do that, but it should still be OK. And I'll also add some to the finial on top of the cupola, a little more brown. Seal it. And next, I'll do some other things like I want to simulate the gutters to show that they're actually hanging. Now, I've gone through and I've actually taken my hobby knife and actually broken the initial glue joint. But I just wanted to make sure that I still, that it would still be secure when I mounted the, the roof onto the finished structure. As you can see, in no time at all, I was able to take this easy-to-build kit and turn it into a heavily weathered, interesting structure to place on our layout. Now with the addition of a few weeds and a swing set in back, we have an abandoned schoolhouse along our modern era main line. The Moffat Tunnel was drilled under the Continental Divide to eliminate uh, 31 miles of mo steep mountainous grades, 4% over Rollins Pass. The Denver and Salt Lake Railroad operated over this mountainous pass from 1904 to 1928 and had many operating problems. Mainly the steep grades required helper engines. The snow conditions in the winter required snow sheds be built over the top of the mountain. There were nine miles of continuous snow sheds on top of the mountain, and they had planned for another nine miles to be built, but that was never completed. Well, that was the reason for building the tunnel. Now, the tunnel was drilled through the mountain, and the first thing they did was drill a pioneer bore, which is a tunnel to the left of the uh, main tunnel. Now, this pioneer bore 
was a, about 10 feet in diameter, or that's what it finished up to be. And it was drilled through the mountain, and then from several points within the mountain, they drilled side tunnels into the main railroad bore and had several headings working all at the same time in the main bore. And they hauled the rock that was cut away, they hauled it out through the uh, Pioneer bore and dumped it out at the east end of the tunnel here. And some was dumped at the west end as well. Now the uh, tunnel, when they were boring it, they did have some water problems leaking in the center, about the center of the bore. And they felt this water came from a lake that was on top of the mountain. And to try to stop the water leak, they hauled uh, boxcar loads of baled cotton to the top of the mountain and then carted it back to this lake and uh, submerged the cotton bales in the lake, hoping it would stop the water flow. But as it turned out, it didn't work like a cork in a sink. They continued to have leaks. And they finally had to solve the problem by building a concrete liner around the railroad tunnel at this leaking area. One of the advantages of this tunnel was that it has a rather constant temperature between 58, 59 degrees. And it was an, an ideal spot for one of the early applications of continuous welded rail. And it is working that way today. The Rio Grande Railroad operates several types of trains through the tunnel today. The only passenger trains are the California Zephyr, uh, operated by Amtrak and, and uh, over the Rio Grande Railroad. And then the other, one other passenger train is the Rio Grande Ski Train that runs from Denver to Winter Park. And then, of course, we have the one of our hotshot freight trains is our Railblazer that is a piggyback type operation, uh, short, fast train concept, uh, express type service. And then uh, there are many unit trains, the coal trains being the, the main ones, of course. We have two or three of them that operate. And then uh, we have uh, other trains, grain trains, and uh, containerized type shipments and stuff. And so we have a, a lot of trains that uh, do run through here each day. The railroad grade approaching the Moffat Tunnel, both from the east portal and the west portal, is 2%. Now this requires that the heavy tonnage coal trains have extra locomotive units to help them up the hill. And many times there's five engines on the point and two or three helper units. The Winter Park Ski Area is the oldest major resort in the state of Colorado, located, interestingly enough, at the west portal of Moffat Tunnel. That, very frankly, was by design. The individual who conceived the idea of the development of Winter Park, a fellow by the name of George Cramner, who was the manager of parks and recreation for the city and county of Denver, came up with the idea of developing a mountain recreation facility that was accessible by train through the mountains. The area was originally built by the city, is still owned by the city and county of Denver, and is operated in part on lands owned by the Moffat Tunnel District. The Moffat Tunnel District is that quasi-municipal entity that developed and built the Moffat Tunnel. Moffat Tunnel District covers actually nine counties or parts of counties in the state of Colorado, uh, counties in the Front Range as well as counties on the Western Slope. Winter Park began operation in 1940 and was operated by the city and county of Denver until 1950. In 1950, the area had fallen into rather serious disrepair, was in fact basically bankrupt, and the city felt they could no longer operate it. The then mayor of the city, Quig Newton, came up with the idea of creating an independent agency that would assume the obligation of operating the area. That nonprofit corporation is made up of 15 volunteers, people who are interested in skiing and interested in Winter Park who took over the operation of the area. They had the obligation to operate, maintain, and develop the area. And in return for that, they got the right to plow the net proceeds back into the operation. The city's investment in 1950 was $200,000. In 1952, they added another $75,000, and that's the last public money that has come into the Winter Park operation. We rank third or fourth in the state of Colorado, and fifth or sixth in the nation with assets that are in the range of about $38 million. Last year, we skied 925,000 skiers, quite a few of whom, very interesting, arrive at Winter Park in the only continuous operating ski train. We have a ski train that comes out of the city of Denver through the Moffat Tunnel every Saturday, Sunday, and holidays, bringing some 700 skiers to the base of the mountain. The Moffat Tunnel, in its 52 years of existence, has remained virtually unchanged. When first designed, the ventilating system, which exhausts and clears the tunnel of exhaust gas and smoke, 
was designed to clear the tunnel in about 45 minutes. Well, today, with the heavier freight traffic on the Rio Grande Railroad, they had to speed that up. So the ventilating system was redesigned, and it will now clear the tunnel in about 15 minutes. The Moffat Tunnel, when first built, was an engineering marvel, and it is today. We've reached the end of the line for this edition. We hope you've enjoyed the ride. We'll have more layouts, prototypes, and how-to tips next time, and more fun with the world's greatest hobby in the Dream, Plan, Build video series. Welcome to the Dream, Plan, Build video series. In this collection, you'll see amazing layouts of fellow modelers, some of the most interesting trains and railroads around, and plenty of tips and techniques to make your time at the workbench and at the throttle more productive and a lot more fun. We'll travel across America in search of layouts we all dream of operating and get inside the heads of their builders as they describe how they designed and built their prized railroads. Plus, whether you're running a 4x8 or a 40x80 operation, You'll discover tips and techniques to make your rolling stock run smoother and look more realistic.